in a world where carbs are your enemy, you need one man to help you fight your battles. That man is Jimmy. Combating nutrition, disinformation, and general bull. It's Jimmy Rants. JimmyRants.com. Welcome to the Nutritional Pearls Podcast, featuring nutritional therapy practitioner Christine Moore and hosted by veteran health podcaster Jimmy Moore. Listen in as they feature nuggets of nutritional knowledge and provide practical application of what to do with this newfound dietary wisdom in your pursuit of optimal health. Visit our website, nutritionalpearlspodcast.com, to explore more nutritional pearls that could change your life. And now it's time to blow you away with today's featured nutritional pearl. Here's Jimmy and Christine. Hey, hey guys, what's going on? Welcome back to another episode of Jimmy Rants. And it's that time of the week, you guys, where I get the beautiful, the lovely, the talented one. You know her as Christine Moore. She is a nutritional therapy practitioner, uh, which is pretty darn cool being an NTP, right? It is. It makes her all nerdy. <laughs> she likes to comment on stuff about nutrition. I was a nerd nutrition. before NTP stuff, so. <laughs> it was so funny because she and I used to do this show uh, called Living La Vida Low Carb on YouTube. And this was way back in the day when I first started, even before I had a podcast. And Christine would get on there and she would hear me, blah, 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 gluconeogenesis, blah, 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 diet, blah, 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 ketogenic, blah, blah. And now she puts words in front of me that I go, um, what did you just say? So, so yes, we are here. This is the one time of the week that Christine or Wiener, <laughs> all of you that are here on YouTube, uh, you will get to see her once a week on my Jimmy rant. So we do a crossover episode for the Nutritional Pearls podcast, which airs on Mondays. And uh, I'm thinking we need to close that front door. Can you go do that real quick? Yep. So yeah, we're listening, or you're listening, you're watching, Jimmy Rants. So go on to JimmyRants.com. We've been doing this show for a little while now, for about six months, 260-something episodes and counting here on YouTube. And Instagram Live is where we've been starting the show, but they've been giving me some trouble lately. So we've now shifted the show, Jimmy Rants, over to the nutritional, uh, or to... Uh, YouTube Live to do the Nutritional Pearls podcast and to do all of the episodes here. So thank you guys for being here. Definitely uh, somebody told me to remind people to hit the bubble uh, that will send you alerts. Hit, Ring the bell. Hit the bell. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm reminding you, hit the bell so you'll get all the alerts anytime I go live, which uh, Jimmy Rants fans will know that that's twice a day. So JimmyRants.com is the website. Today's Jimmy Rants, Christine and I wanted for our Jimmy Rants Nutritional Pearls podcast crossover episode to respond to something that happened this week. So those of you that pay attention in the nutritional health space, you'll know that uh, the Joe Rogan Experience podcast has been doing a whole lot of information about health and diet uh, Joe Rogan actually has started embracing a lot of the ketogenic message. And so he's had on various people, Dominique D'Agostino. Um, he's had on Gary Taubes by himself. He's had various experts on. Well, when Gary Taubes, who is very well known in the low carb world for writing the book, Good Calories, Bad Calories, Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It, and then The Case for Sugar, when he, uh, when he was on Joe Rogan's show, I want to say it was like late last year, uh, Joe Rogan got a, an email from this guy named Stephen Guillenay. Stephen Guillenay is a uh, researcher who has been in the health space. Uh, when I first met Stephen, he was in the paleo world. And the rift between Gary Taubes and mm -hmm. Stephen Guillenay goes back to the paleo. In fact, the very first paleo conference was called the Ancestral Health Symposium. You and I were both there mm -hmm. at UCLA. Yep. And that was in 2011. 
and Stefan had just presented his uh, information about his theory of food reward, that the reason we get obese, his theory is, uh, is because we have foods that are highly, highly palatable, and it's the palatability that affects the brain chemistry, and it's the brain chemistry that then kicks in, making you want to eat more and more food. That's his theory. Mm -hmm. uh, so Gary Taubes, who is of the hormone hypothesis theory, that insulin is at the root cause of why people get fat, um, he asked Stefan a question about, you know, well, what about this group and what about that group? They don't fit your model. Uh, and they had kind of an interesting tit for tat. So that is the historical context mm -hmm. for when they did their um, debate this week on Joe Rogan. Now, who watched that uh, three hours of the debate? I can't get that three hours back. Christine and I, <laughs> for you guys, we sat through all three hours. And we want to give you some commentary here today on the Nutritional Pearls podcast to kind of give you some context about what was said, how it was said, uh, what we think about things that were said on both sides. So um, you want to start, since this was your idea, sure. wanting to talk about this. So sure. um, what was your initial mm. thought when you heard these two were going to debate? I, I was like, oh, this is really going to be interesting. Um, right. Just, just knowing their history and... You know, in all honesty, listening to the podcast uh, that just happened, um, it was very hard to listen to Stephen Guillenay talk just because of how disrespectful he was. That was the most and disappointing. I understand, I understand that it kind of all started back in, in 2011, right. but Stephen should have been the bigger guy and treated Gary with a little bit more respect than he did. It made it very hard for me to sit there and listen to his side of things because of the way that he, he was acting like a little spoiled brat. Well, and to me, this is part of the problem with the nutritional health space. Um, it ends up becoming a pissing match, so mm -hmm. to speak. Oh, no, I, I, I have the theory that ends all theories that explains obesity and disease, and it's the insulin hypothesis. Oh, no, 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 you're all wrong. I have the theory to end all theories when it comes to obesity and disease. It's food reward, and if we just change the uh, kind of food that mixes fat and protein or fat and uh, carbohydrate together that makes it highly palatable, that's Stephen Guillenay's position, uh, then we would solve all the obesity problems in the world. And what you and I, as we were sitting there listening to it, she kept going, whoa, whoa I got a comment. So <laughs> what you and I kept coming to the conclusion of is why does it have to be a tit for tat pissing match? Yeah. Why can't it be a little bit of truth from both? So, yeah, so here's my thinking. Uh, when Stefan was talking about the, the brain... And, and how he thought that that was um, the culprit in, in obesity. I, I thought about several things. First of all, I thought about you have all these skinny people out there that... We hate you, by the way. ...that are eating <laughs> th these highly palatable foods. Right. Yet they don't gain any weight. Oh, What's we, going it, on yeah. with them? Yeah. I used to be that way. I used to be stick thin and eating whatever I wanted. Well, and what about the flip side of that? What about people that are have lymphedema? Yeah. And they've got these huge deposits of fat on their body that have nothing to do with the nutrition that right. they eat. They could eat right. nothing, and that lymphedema still shows up as fatty deposits. So, Well, I'm thinking about you, too. You, yeah. What, you eat a very clean diet, and yet you're still struggling with some extra weight. And so there's other things going on. We are very highly individualized. Back, um, uh, here's one thing that I thought of too. Um, in in uh, the Egyptians long ago, they were eating, they, they didn't have highly palatable foods and they were eating real whole foods, the grains and stuff like that. Yeah, they, they were, the grains then were different, but yet there were signs of obesity and heart disease. heart disease and things like that with them without these highly processed foods that we have today from these big companies. So there's something else going on. And then 
I thought about Pottinger's uh, cat study. So part of the study, well, let me just give you a Explain little. Explain what Pottinger's let, cat let me is. Give you a little, yeah, so uh, Francis Pottinger. You're going to hate Pottinger, by the way. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Francis Pottinger, um, he took, a, I think it was 900 cats. And it was it was a total of 900 cats. That, we have including four. Including their offspring. So yeah. you're talking about, you know, several Over generations. Over generations, right. So he... Part of the study in, involved him feeding one group um, raw meat and raw milk and some cod liver oil. And then the other group he fed cooked meat, um, raw milk, and cod liver oil. And he wanted to show the differences that, you know, the cooked meat led to more disease in cats. But then another part, another arm of the study, he gave these cats um, different types of milk. So one group he gave the raw, one milky, uh, one one milk, one group he gave the whole milk, another one um, skim milk, and then another one sweetened condensed milk. So the what the study showed was that the group that had the sweetened condensed yeah, milk yeah. showed the greatest uh, signs Obesity. of disease, right. and then once. Uh, Pottinger put those cats back on their native or How long did it take? Diet. It took four generations. Four generations. For the, the offspring to become healthy. Meaning again. that there was some genetic predisposition for obesity and disease that happened in those next three generations that no matter how good they ate, they weren't going to overcome. I think part of Stefan's uh, proposal was that, oh, well, you stop eating... These things and it all these things automatically go away. No, without that, taking into effect the damage that might have been done right from generations back. Right, what you're and saying. So I think it when he, the, he wasn't giving those cats the the highly palatable foods as far as what he thinks is highly palatable right. is the fat, the sugar, and um, help me out here. Well, the fat natural, and carbs fat, com combination. Fat, yeah, yeah. That's what he's saying. And salt. But the salt, problem, yeah. and, and salt, but the problem with a lot of the highly palatable foods, let's just call it, it's crappy garbage, it's mm -hmm. the junk food, is they have the worst of the worst offender in carbohydrates, uh, refined sugars and refined grains, the worst of the worst in uh, fat. It's usually the vegetable oils and highly processed, hydrogenized oils and that kind of thing. So you combine mm -hmm. two very bad elements and you smush them together and then you put all kind of additives in there mm -hmm. that make them highly addictive. Of course, they're going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. But that fits both the insulin theory and the food reward theory. Yeah. So in Stefan's world... If someone eats a sweet potato, they should not have a negative response in their blood sugar. <laughs> I can tell you I do. <laughs> um, and yeah, you and I both do. So so it is fascinating that the explanation that uh, people like Stefan Guillenet, who is a brilliant researcher, but he's very dug in uh, to his theory um, yeah. to the point that I think if he acknowledged, okay, yeah, there's some people that have insulin resistance, that even those real whole food, non-palatable carbohydrate um, foods still have a bad response from those. Yeah, I don't think he's taking into consideration uh, the bio-individuality of everybody right. either. Um, and just knowing what I know about the basic biochemistry and anatomy and physiology, how the body responds to mm -hmm. things. It is the sugar to me. It is the sugar that, that causes the problem. So it's, it's a combination of both. I think so you have the sugar. Is the sugar's impact on endocrine? Is that what you're saying? The endocrine yeah. system yeah. and specifically blood sugar. And if it gets wonky, all the down regulation effects that, that it presents in the form of disease. Yeah. So I, I think that the sugar, um, messes with the endocrine system. You can't get your blood sugar regulated. Yep. And if until you get your blood sugar regulated, there's no hope in um, balancing your other hormones. Yeah, blood sugar doesn't even come into account with the food reward, um, highly palatable theory. And see, this is where I think if Stefan would have stepped that direction and said, hey, look, you want to try a sweet potato, test your blood sugar, test your insulin response, after having that, that will tell the tale. 
But I think Gary also made some mistakes as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. Uh, both were a bit pompous and full of themselves. You can get so focused on your yeah. your theory that you totally purpose either purposefully or not purposefully just neglect other right. um, factors. Well, and I think Gary could have put an olive branch out to Stefan. He kept calling him the wrong name, Stephen. Stefan, well, he used every variation except for <laughs> Stefan. I'm like, how hard is it to say Stefan Guillaume? Anyway, that's an aside. Go listen to yeah. the Joe Rogan experience. You'll know what we're talking about. If you're just joining us, we are doing our weekly crossover episode of Jimmy Rants with the Nutritional Pearls podcast. And we're talking mm -hmm. about the big debate that happened this past week on the Joe Rogan experience podcast between Gary Taubes, a uh, New York Times bestselling author of Good Calories, Bad Calories, Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It, as well as The Case for Sugar. And his uh, debate opponent uh, was Stephen Guiana. He is a PhD uh, and, and has this theory about food reward. He's also written a book called The Hungry Brain. So the two kind of went off, but what, where, I, where we were going with this is Stephen needed to meet Gary a little bit in his direction and say, mm -hmm. okay, um, if it is the insulin, then let's test insulin, let's test blood sugar, even after eating a real whole food-based carbohydrate like a sweet potato. But I think Gary could have met mm -hmm. Stefan, yep. and here's the thing, and have it fit the, the hormone hypothesis. That's the funny thing mm -hmm. to me is a lot of what Stefan was sharing about was brain chemistry that causes you to eat more. I think that the fat and the carbohydrates that you would consume that would be that highly palatable food, the reason it impacts your brain is because of the um, hormone effects. What yeah, do you think? Well, sugar, it has been proven to light up the same part of the brain that, that drugs do, the, the addictive drugs. And so as far as that premise goes, it's correct. But saying that it's completely that that makes you obese, yeah. no. Because, because like I said uh, before, you can have thin people eating these highly addictive foods right. and, you know, they not gain weight. It's still having some effect on it. And see, it goes back to Gary's too. There, there's still a hormonal impact going on. But there's for, always a hormonal impact. But for whatever impact. reason, the person has good genetics that they can handle that sort of thing. Right. And so that's where I think they don't talk about the genetic factors and how it's just like with muscle builders, you know, you're not meant to hang on. <laughs> oh. We got a call guys. And so it stops the video when we got a call. Oy. Now go. So you're not meant to be like Arnold Schwarzenegger if you were to lift weights. You don't have those genetics that makes you predisposed to being able to, to beef up. I mean, I think it goes the same way with, with diet. I think that you have a hormonal response with the insulin, but then these food companies have come in and have, have just made these foods even more palatable. And so it, there's, it's two, it's both theories. Well, and my problem is when, like you said, there's such a, it has to be one or the other. It's just frustrating, especially to the consumer who's trying to take the best of both worlds of what both of them are sharing. And it seems like they're both so dug in on their own position. I want to ask Stefan, okay, so what role does blood sugar play at all in your theory? And I would say that blood sugar going up, causing insulin and other hormones to go up, is part of what's contributing to his food reward, highly palatable food theory. The reason the brain goes excitable is because there's been a hormonal response. And then I wish Gary would acknowledge, okay, yes, the hormone insulin is critical. Um, and I know in the interview, uh, it was brought up well uh, by uh, Stefan. Well, you're ignoring leptin and its role in this equation as well. Uh, he's not, but that's what was brought up. Yeah. And I'm thinking it would be good if they would just take a step towards one another because I think they could coalesce in the middle somewhere around some unified theory that marries both concepts. 
Yeah. Well, when you talk about leptin, that's a hormone, right? I've heard of it, yes. So, is it the insulin that controls? The insulin is known as the master hormone, right? It is. Although, if you talk to Ron Rosedale, he'll tell you leptin uh, plays a bigger role than insulin. But, yes. Yeah. It's generally known insulin is as the master hormone. So, um, yeah. Anyway, (laughs) it's one of those things. But... Um, so you can have somebody that maybe uh, that leptin is that's the hunger hormone, right? No, ghrelin is the hunger hormone. Ghrelin is Le- hunger hormone. Leptin is the other one. So, um, so you can have these things. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get. You're my, rambling, so I'm trying to get you to go. Move I know. Along. I'm trying to get my thoughts back together <laughs> since we got I messed know. up. We we have a lot of ghrelin that has been uh, activated here with the. Uh, <laughs> technical difficulties we've what i'm trying to say is these other hormones can be impacted and yet the person not gain weight there's there's certain people certain people there's there's a lot of factors that go to is a person stressed are they getting good sleep all of these things kind of play into how a person is going to gain weight or not gain here is the other thing that always ticks me off about these debates like this all of the onus of whatever the modality is, uh, limiting carbs and sugar as a means to control insulin or limiting highly palatable foods as a means of lowering uh, the food reward system, the, the uh, you know, and, and, and Stefan's case. I, and they always put the onus on um, weight loss. Why is it always on weight loss? To me, the much more interesting factor is what is whatever that modality is doing to insulin levels? What is that modality, whatever it is, doing to inflammation levels? What is that modality, whatever it is, doing to your A1C? Some like real clear markers of health or not health. Mm -hmm. Triglycerides would be thrown in there as well. Maybe HDL cholesterol, maybe small dense LDL uh, cholesterol. There's so many markers that okay, we want to test these theory, uh, these theories like this. Let's run them all, all these specific health markers and parameters, and let's see how the changes happen with whatever the the protocol is. To me, that's a lot better way of doing this than simply looking at body weight on a scale to determine whether something's doing good or bad. So, Stefan Guiné totally dismisses sugar in that he's saying that it doesn't cause weight gain. I would say that it does. Well, but well that, but- ha- hang on. To be clear on his position, he didn't say it does not cause weight gain. Not as fast. He, he said very clearly in the interview that it's one of many contributors mm-hmm. to weight gain, which we would agree with. Yeah, yeah. But what I was going to say is that sugar i i think is a big proponent of of cause of other health and i can't hold the phone now go ahead sugar Uh, other health issues so like if you have sugar that causes your um, body to uh, the cells in the body to harden and when it combines with those proteins and so it the glycation you're talking about right and so your cells harden and this is what leads to eyesight problems it leads to um kidney problems it leads to people losing their limbs i mean diabetes that's that's what uh sugar does and so just to I know that Stefan is saying that it's a multiplicity of things, but to, it sounds like to me he's he's kind of downgrading sugar. As well, of not course being... he is because it does. Well, sugar plays a role in his hypothesis in as much as it's combined with fat. Yeah. He thinks sugar alone isn't nearly as um, addictive and and palatable uh, and into his theory as Gary is to his theory that sugar is at the base of why insulin goes up uh, and carbohydrates that turn to sugar in the body um, and that we reduce those, we improve health. Mm -hmm. It's so frustrating, you guys, because we've got these two strong personalities that are both trying to articulate their particular point of view. I wonder if there's a more reasonable insulin hypothesis advocate and a more reasonable kind of calorie apologist that if they redid this exact same debate, 
um, would come to a far different conclusion without the contentiousness. That That's the thing. I've been in this space for so long. I'm just over. I'm just so sick of the tit for tat. My diet's better than yours. No, my theory, yeah. my theory beats yours because that really helps nobody at the end of the day. And I'm very much in the camp of Gary Taub's and the insulin hypothesis, I, I definitely believe it's more of the right answer than not. But I don't think Gary did us any favors mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. the way he came across on video. Mm -hmm. um, neither one of the gentlemen acted like uh, adults here. No, they didn't. And the thing that we need to remember is that we're all on the same side. We're trying to get people healthy. Yeah, Gary's coming at it from his way and Stefan's coming at it from his direction. But in reality, we're all on the same side just trying to get people um, healthy. And something, we can all agree that something needs to be done yeah. about it. I hate I hate even talking about calories. I mean, we don't even need to go there. Well, that's a whole nother Jimmy Rance nutritional pearls for a whole nother day. Yeah. Um, but I do think that Stefan's position is very much rooted in calories in, calories out. Yeah. Because the notion is uh, that the reason you get obese and sick from the highly palatable foods and the changes in the brain chemistry is by the over consumption of calories. And thus <laughs> that leads to weight gain. What? No, I was just going to say, so let's try this. If any, any of y'all want to be brave <clears throat> and try this, I, I couldn't do it or you couldn't do it either. I wouldn't so, do it. In my opinion, this is where he definitely has it wrong. A calorie is not a calorie is not a calorie. So if I were to have, and I expressed this on my Instagram uh, page, if I eat a thousand calories worth of Twinkies, Ew. what my, is that? My blood sugar is going to go up. What is that about? Twelve Twinkies? I don't know. Probably. Um, whole box of Twinkies. My blood sugar is going to go up. My Doesn't insulin is going to go up, and I'm going to have all sorts of problems. And she's going to be bouncing off the walls in the Moore household. Yeah, exactly. But if I have a thousand calories of a steak with a nice fatty sauce on it, yeah, and some non starchy veggies, yeah, my blood sugar is going to remain steady. I'm not going to become grouchy. My insulin is going to remain steady, and I am going to remain healthy. So if any of y'all think that calories are all equal, try eating a thousand, try, try eating Twinkies for a period of time. See how you do. And then eat steak and non-starchy veggies. Of the same amount of calories of the same you're amount saying. Of calories and see how so you do. I'm going to throw a monkey wrench in your theory. <laughs> um, I agree with what you're saying yeah. that obviously those two different, they're same calories, but different uh, food-like uh, agents um, would respond differently in the body. But mm -hmm. Stefan would say that's proving his theory because his theory is it's the highly palatable foods uh, that would be the Twinkies. And the Twinkies would be that kind of food that would make you want to eat more and more and more and thus put on weight. Mm -hmm. Whereas he would say the steak and the vegetables is not highly palatable. Therefore, Who you're... says? <laughs> therefore, you're Have not... Have you guys ever had bacon? That's highly palatable. <laughs> therefore, you're not going to get that response. <laughs> I'm, I'm just telling you, that's how he would explain no, that. No, I know. Each of them, Gary and Stefan, would twist things. Well, I don't know about twist. I no, mean, it fits I the twist, hypothesis. No, when I say twist, I mean... Twist would... means you manipulate. So yes. use another word. What do you um... mean? We're gonna see how good her linguistic they, skills are. Uh, I, you're the you're the English interpret. Major, no? Interpret. They would interpret <laughs> something a certain way to make it fit <coughs> their hypothesis or their their position. Well, if it fits the hypothesis, then that's fine. Um, I think for Gary, um, the hormonal response is what would uh, explain that. If you're gonna eat a bunch of Twinkies. Your insulin, your blood sugar will go way up. Your insulin will will respond in response to that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And and you'll have a very clear hormonal response. Whereas with the steak and the vegetables, uh, blood sugar should not spike. Thus, insulin should not go up to great levels, more so than what your body needs to deal with that blood sugar. Um, so, what happens when you have um, sugar? When you have 
crappy garbage. Um, and I, you could even do this like with a teaspoon of honey or just a teaspoon of sugar. What's going to happen 15, 30 minutes, an hour later, you're going to have a spike Hunger. in blood sugar and then it's going to drop. A drop in blood sugar signals hypoglycemia, yeah. and, and that symptoms of that is is hunger, it's irritability, irritability confusion, fatigue. Sweats. I, I get really tired real fast when I get hypoglycemia. Yeah. So, but that's also another hormone involved that's not working properly. The the um, glucagon, right? So, um, but that's that's so if you have just like a teaspoon of sugar, you're not having what Stefan would say with those highly palatable foods that's mixed with the salt and the fat. You're just having the sugar, right. but yet you have that sugar, you're gonna have that um, spike in blood sugar, then you're gonna crash, and then you're gonna become hungry again. Yeah. That's why some people, when they have um, too much protein for their needs, the gluconeogenesis kicks in, their blood sugar goes up, it falls, and then they get hungry. Part of the challenge in this conversation, you guys, is we're only looking at the <clears throat> impact on the weight. And I think if Stefan Guiana and Gary Taub said, okay, let's come up with what those parameters are for determining how we're doing on this particular, you know, whatever the protocol is, um, be it blood sugar, mm -hmm. be it insulin levels postprandial after meal, because uh, that's huge. Mm -hmm. um, be it inflammation markers like HSCRP, uh, whatever, be it A1C, I think if they all coalesced around what those markers are that are better than weight, because I think weight gets too much weight, <laughs> all pun intended, um, as kind of the marker that people are paying attention to. And I realize people want to lose weight, so it's all good. But in this conversation about nutrition, mm -hmm. I think if you leave out the health markers, then you leave out the underlying things that are going on that may explain one over the other hypothesis. Well, I was just thinking back to, you know, I, I've tried certain foods and I saw a rise in, in blood sugar. Yeah, talk so, about it. Well, I mean, I was just thinking for me, I have seen weight gain. If it's all about the highly palatable foods, he would not consider a sweet potato to be highly palatable. Uh, he would not consider rice to be highly palatable. But when I was eating those things, I gained weight. Well, you didn't gain weight first. What you first had happen, even if you weren't measuring it, was you had a spike in your blood sugar, yeah. which then insulin had to go extraordinarily high. Yeah. See, this is the, it's kind of the cart before the horse. Yeah, uh, yeah it is. Um, you, you, you have to say, okay, because insulin went up and other hormonal factors went up as a direct result of blood sugar go up, which is a direct result of the carbohydrates that you ate in your diet, mm -hmm. because you had all that cascade of events happen in your blood markers, you would have seen the obesity happening long before it happened mm -hmm. in those blood markers. So Wait, what I'm see, yeah. so what I'm proposing is we need to come up with what those blood markers would be mm -hmm. that would then be the precursor to the obesity happening. Mm -hmm. Now, like we said earlier, there are some people that they put on weight um, and they're hardly eating anything. And then there's other people that are stick thin who could eat pretty much whatever they want and never gain a pound. I think both of those groups are outliers into this. Yeah. I think the vast majority of people, they eat carbs, it raises blood sugar, that raises the insulin levels, the insulin starts to become resistant because it keeps getting spiked again and again and again, having to deal with it every single day, and it becomes disordered, and that's when the problems come into play as pounds start getting packed on, mm -hmm. health starts to decline, and you would mm -hmm. see that in all of those health markers that we just mm -hmm. talked about. And something else to consider, too, I, I think, it, going back to the Pottinger's cat study, it took four generations for the offspring of uh, that original cat to become healthy again. Right. So that tells me, okay, let's just say my mother had a very poor diet right. and she got pregnant with me and continued to eat a poor diet. That right. is obviously affecting me so when she wrote I'm it born, into your DNA, you're so, saying. Yeah, so when I was born, I have a 
a higher likelihood probably of not being able to have certain things because of her not because of of anything you've done right because of the damage that has already been done to me yeah so as you guys can see this is not an easy subject to discuss which is what made that debate between gary taubes and stefan guiane uh so incredibly frustrating because it seems like they didn't really acknowledge a lot of what we're talking about here today. All right, I want to see what you guys have to say. See how it's a little bit weird on the yeah, uh, it is. Wow. on uh, <laughs> YouTube. So bear with me, guys. Yeah, so I missed all of those comments that came in on the original video, so I apologize for that. Slightly Vegan says, I'm all for low-carb diets, but Gary Taubes drives me insane like he drives Evelyn insane. <laughs> no comment. Uh, I can see how people love Gary. Um, I'm a big Durian Rider fan who says to drink sodas and eat white sugar. Yeah, I'll leave that to Durian Rider because that does not work well for me. I would be so unhealthy if I did that. I'm sorry. Joke says, I don't know either one of these guys, Gary Taubes or Stefan Guiana. So if you've been in the nutritional health space for a little while, um, then, whoa, then you would know um, who these guys are. They're pretty much... Um, leaders in the industry of trying to determine what causes obesity, what causes disease, uh, and that kind of thing. So um, look them up. Uh, Let's see. It would be nice if you could do some blood sugar tests on those competitive eaters that eat 60 hot dogs in eight minutes, says Joke. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it would. (laughs) Uh, I bet it would be Funky Monkey. Um, Alberto, what's up, man? I'm glad you made it over to YouTube Live. I remember my my discussion with someone who commented about Twinkies on Christine's Instagram about someone eating them for a month and supposedly his health markers were great. So that was Dr. Mark Halb. I've actually had him on the Live and La Vida Low Carb Show and he didn't just eat Twinkies in the month. Twinkies were a part of his diet, but most of the rest of his diet was relatively a low carb diet. But of course, the media ran with it. Oh, gay, guy ate Twinkies every day for you know a certain amount of time, and they made it look like that's all he ate. He did a calorie restricted diet, and then he ate low carb foods with the Twinkies. So it wasn't just Twinkies. He would have died because there's no protein or yeah anything yeah. good in there. Mm. Uh, would eating almonds spike your blood sugar because they definitely make me want to eat more of them? Uh, they shouldn't. I wouldn't think so. They're not highly palatable. No. Um, so it doesn't fit the hypothesis of Gary, of, uh, uh, Stefan. Gary's hypothesis would say they're low carb, so they shouldn't spike your, uh, insulin levels. How much of it is, um, you craving the food versus like mindless eating. Or, so it or, would be a mental thing, not a physiological yeah, thing yeah. that would make you want to have more and more and more uh, almonds. Yeah, I've yeah. never heard of anybody getting addicted to almonds. Yeah. Um, I would eat candy bars and not gain any weight, says Shirley, but that doesn't mean it's good for you at all. So yeah, I mean, some people, they're able to handle the carbohydrate load that would be in a candy bar um, but it still would have an effect on blood sugar. Mm-hmm. Even on somebody who's handling it weight-wise, it would still impact their blood sugar, their right. inflammation levels, their yeah. insulin levels, all of that. Well, and your thyroid comes into play there because the thyroid um, controls your metabolism yeah. and your metabolic rate. And so you could have somebody that has hyperthyroidism True. that's undiagnosed and and. Obviously, we saw this in in one of our cats. Her mm-hmm. metabolism was twenty times higher than a normal cat's. Yeah, she would eat and eat and eat and, and would eat not stop and eating. not gain weight. Yeah, and so that's you, that that's just another factor that comes into play. That, right, you know, do you have thyroid issues? New channel says, does that response happen with sweeteners triggering your insulin even without the uh, glucose? Uh, intake. Some some sweeteners, yeah. Um, what I think sweeteners? HK is one of those, I think. That... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So in my book, The Keto Cure, you can go get it on Amazon. Um, we have a whole list, we have a whole chapter just about sweeteners mm-hmm. and which ones are, are really, really bad in HK, acesulfame, potassium. They tend to put in a lot of kind of diet drinks. It makes them taste sweeter. Yeah. Alberto said, I noticed that when people uh, go high carb, low fat, 
typically they'll lose weight, but it's because they're malnourished, yep. not the same on keto, yep. uh, and they use it as the only proof as to why they're becoming healthy is the weight loss. Alberto, thank you as always. Yes. I'm really glad you're back here on uh, on my uh, Jimmy Rants because that is a very prescient comment. It is. They all want to put the focus on the weight loss uh, when in actuality, it's the health markers that I think matter far better, far more. So yeah, these nutrients, if you eat a high carbohydrate diet, you're actually having nutrients, depending on the carbs too. Yeah. But uh, if, you're, if your diet's primarily carbohydrates, you're actually having nutrients taking, taken out of your body. They're anti-nutrients, yes. a lot of, yeah. of carb-based foods. Yep. Slightly Vegan says, all these macro ratio debates are silly. I agree with you. I think it's just absurd that that we have to argue over, well, I need this percentage of carbohydrate, this mm. percent. Screw you. Just eat food. Find it, what works for you. Yeah. And if what you're doing currently is working for you, yeah. I, I say go for it. That's where the bio-individuality comes into play. Yeah. Oh, there's Olivia Brown. Remember Olivia? I do. She says, I'm glad you guys are talking about this. Well, <laughs> that's that's why we're here. It's why we do our Nutritional Pearls podcast. Um, I can tell this subject drives you too a little crazy. Yes, <laughs> a little bit, slightly vegan, a little bit. Kim Call says, I'm listening to The Obesity Code. Uh, that's Dr. Jason Fung's book on Audible. I was surprised to hear that stevia is low glycemic but can still raise your insulin level. Uh, love the health uh, with keto, uh, but golly, some weight has got to go eventually, says Darla. Mm -hmm. It will. It will, and and try uh, as I tell my clients who may be discouraged with the weight aspect of it. Um, you know, one particular client, um, she's seen um, small improvements, like improvement in energy, improvement in inflammation. So she used to go to a physical therapist for certain things, and now she's not having to do that That's because awesome. of the ketogenic diet. So I told her. Let's not focus, or I tell my clients, don't focus on the weight. Think of those non-scale, as you call them, victories. Yeah. It's not about the weight. No. About the weight. Oh. See that my, my inner Megan trainer came out. <laughs> New Channel says, I just ordered Keto Clarity. Thank you. And the reduction of inflammation on keto has been awesome. Yeah. That's the biggest reason. I think we need to shift it away from so obsessively focusing on the diet and instead focus on what is whatever your diet plan, whatever your modality for getting healthy, what is it doing to specific blood markers? So can we can we coalesce around blood sugar is a good marker to yeah. test regardless? Yeah. Can we coalesce around if you can run your insulin level mm -hmm. and when we have the ability to do that at home it'll make it a whole lot easier it's coming guys mm -hmm. yeah. a few more years away but it's coming uh can we coalesce around looking at inflammation markers like hscrp yep. that that's really good can we coalesce around triglycerides meaning something and if, it, if they're below 100 definitely optimally below 70 that that's a good thing so then that regardless of what your theory is and regardless of what you choose to do dietary uh, diet wise those are the markers you're looking to make sure they're in the optimal level yeah and I, this whole weight thing i totally agree with you we need to stop focusing on weight because <clears throat> i used to be underweight you would look at me on the street and say, oh, well, she's healthy because she's so thin. Right. Uh, no, I was very unhealthy. But yes, yet someone looks at you that has a little bit of extra weight. Yeah. I would put your numbers up against most blood markers. You're saying. Blood markers against most people out there that are eating the standard American diet. And I can guarantee you who is going to be healthier. Joke says not only blood markers, uh, but also blood pressure. Yes. Um, and I agree. That, yeah, and when I say blood markers, that tends to be the ones that people can focus on. And when they go to the doctor and the doctor freaks out about LDL, don't freak out about LDL, by the way, yeah. uh, or total cholesterol. Uh, but you're right. Blood pressure would be another one of those yep. that would be a clear marker if things are going good or bad for you. Yeah, so bl blood pressure can happen for many different reasons, and uh, one of the, a big thing is dehydration. So um, it, it's just because you have an elevated blood 
pressure, don't be too concerned about mm -hmm. that. No, just look at, make sure you're drinking enough water. But yes, that, that, is a, that is one to check as well. Zoe says, I can only lose weight on keto if I count my calories and keep them under 1,600 a day. I'm just saying, since it's always touted on keto as no need to count calories well, I don't think anybody's saying there's, quote, no need to count calories. It's just that when you're eating to satiety and you're eating enough dietary fat, the need to count them becomes less and less and less. And we've seen this uh, vetted out in a lot of research studies that have come out. Volick and Finney uh, uh, are the two preeminent researchers in this realm. And I remember Dr. Volick presented a paper one time at a conference that I attended and he did uh, two side-by-side -side diets. One of the diets was a low-fat diet, high-carb diet, that they put them on 1,800 calories. And then they put the ketogenic end, uh, very low carb, below 20 grams of total carbs a day, and then uh, you basically gave them a set amount of protein and then said, eat fat, you know, ad libitum, mm -hmm. you, know, ad, ad, you know, to satiety. And they ended up eating exactly the same number of calories mm -hmm. as the low fat end of things. And they lost more weight. They had more improvements in a lot of the health markers that we've talked about here today. So if you find that counting your calories and keeping them below 1,600 is working for you, then go for it. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. And if that keeps you very structured, that's great. But at some point, let your body tell you when you've had enough or not enough. I was just going to say, we have gotten so used to, because we eat by the clock, we have forgotten how to listen to our bodies. And you know, I tell my clients you know, do what works for you yep. uh, as far as keeping track. If you want to keep track of the macros, fine, do that. If not, don't worry about it. Um, I, I think the thing that I focus on uh, first is making sure that I get enough fat in my diet. And your mm -hmm. body will let you know if you don't have enough fat because you will be hungry right. really quickly after your Hormonally, it'll hit you fast. So your, your brain needs fat. Your hormone production needs fat. You need fat for a proper immune response. You need fat to properly digest food. So that's the first thing that I focus on. And then I just listen to my body. Mm -hmm. And so for me... I don't worry about counting calories because I've gotten to the point where I can listen to my body. If I'm hungry, I will eat. If I'm thirsty, I'll drink. Yeah. And if I'm not hungry or thirsty, I won't eat or drink. Right. <laughs> Gee, imagine that. <laughs> Alberto says some food and supplements stimulate the secretion of insulin without having any spike in your glucose. That's true. Mm -hmm. um, as your experiment with high protein. Yeah, last year I did a three to one protein to fat ratio, no carbohydrates, all animal-based foods, and I had issues uh, with my insulin going up. No glucose spike, but a hypoglycemic effect. Yeah, I had 15 bouts of hypoglycemia last year. Yeah. Uh, yes, intuitive eating is my next goal, says Zoe. Excellent. Yeah. Counting calories. It takes time to, to get to that point. That's right. Counting calories is a relatively new concept, says Alberto. <clears throat> yeah, mm -hmm. if you ask our great-grandma, uh, which would have been right about, what, 100 years ago, our yeah. great-grandmothers were, were around, yeah. um, would they have counted calories mm -hmm. ever? No. ever, 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 nope. ever, ever? Slightly Vegan says, I've gotten healthy listening to both high-carb and low-carb camps. And that's mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say here today. Thank yep. you for that, Slightly Vegan. Yep. Um, I think both have merit. Mm -hmm. I think both offer incredible contributions to the community. Let's don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, so right. to speak. And, and that's one thing that I want to get across. And that's why I said that, that Gary has his stance, Stefan has his stance, but we're all on the same side, whether you're, you're ketogenic, where you, whether you're high fat or whether you're, you're, um, high carbohydrate, right. if, if it's working for you, great. And each, each position has their merits that you can mm -hmm. learn something from, anybody. Mm -hmm. Olga says fat also delays the glucose response, which yes, is true. Yes, it does. Yep. Everybody always talks about fiber with that. Oh, eat fiber and it'll delay the glucose response. And I'm mm. like, yeah, but it's still a carbohydrate. Okay. At least fat is a way to delay the response without adding additional carbohydrate. And depending on your metabolic status, even the fiber in some people can cause problems. Yeah. 
Uh, JG says, I only count the sum of protein and net carbs. I call it NCP. Uh, the next best-selling diet book, The <laughs> NCP Diet by JG. Uh, I eat 100 to 105 NCPs per day. Doing well with that. Don't mm -hmm. really care about the calories or the fat. Yeah, as, Interesting. Long, as long as you're feeling well, um, just know that that the fat is very important for your body. We need it for so many things. So if you start to experience problems, look at your fat. But yeah, if, if you're if what you're doing is working for you, yeah, go for it. Yeah. So guys, the bottom line in this Jimmy Rants Nutritional Pearls Pod uh, podcast crossover episode is you're going to hear a lot of kind of debates like the Gary Taubes and Stephen Guiana debate that happened this week on the Joe Rogan Experience podcast. It was great exposure for those guys. Joe has the fourth most listened to podcast, overall podcast in the entire world. Jimmy Moore would love could to you, be on could there. Could you interview somebody for three hours like that? I don't think I... I I, I've done, the longest I've done as far as a podcast interview was an hour and 48 minutes. It was Dr. Steve Finney. <laughs> well, he, that's understandable. I was going to say, if it's a talker, <laughs> then maybe, but he, he just wind him up and let him go. But Joe, uh, you could tell in that, in that show, he was getting very frustrated mm -hmm. yeah. um, because he was hoping that they could coalesce around some unification of theories, yep. uh, but neither one of them was having anything of it. But yep. what I want to say here is what, what our commentary is saying is listen to all the sides, get all of the information, and then at the end of the day, figure out what's applicable to you. Maybe there's something that Gary said that applies to you, but doesn't apply to someone else. Maybe there's something Stefan said, uh, Stephen said, <laughs> I still can't believe he couldn't say Stephen Guiana. Um, that applies to you, but not to someone else. And that's okay. It goes back to what we talk about so often here on Jimmy Rants and, and Nutritional Pearls podcast is bio-individuality. We mm -hmm. are all different. And, yeah. if, and, and, you know, people, we have to celebrate that. We just have to celebrate the differences that we have. We can all agree that there is a healthcare crisis and that something needs to be done about it. There you go. Why can't we be friends? Why can't we be friends? Why can't we be friends? <laughs> so guys, uh, Christine, thanks for joining us again today on Thank your you. show, the mm -hmm. Nutritional Pearls Podcast. Thank you. And guys, that's it for this episode of Jimmy Rants. And if you like the show, we're starting to do them now here on YouTube Live. And if my phone doesn't explode and kick me off again, we're going to try to do this on a consistent basis. Thank you for being patient with me while I got my thoughts back together after yeah, we, the crash. <laughs> we, we were quite thrown off our game. Uh, so check it out, you guys. We do a couple times a day here on Jimmy Rants. We do a couple of uh, Jimmy Rants episodes where I just go off on some topic. If some stupid headline is out there, I'm addressing it. If it's something interesting that's on my mind, I try to um, I try to address it here as well. So JimmyRants.com, if you want to check out the work that I've been doing, go and look at the past episodes. We got them right there embedded right there at JimmyRants.com. We also have a podcast for this show. If you'll go ahead and uh, listen to it, it's on Apple Podcasts as well as Stitcher. And again, those links, you guys, are at JimmyRants.com. Dot com And Joke says, no lack of material on stupid headlines. <laughs> no, no, there's not. Sadly, no. So guys, until next time.